Uh, let's continue reading our uh, main comes. Yesterday, uh, during my last read, uh, it was Hitler. Hitler talked about. Uh, let me see. I can't remember what was it. What was Hitler talk talking about? He talked about the education. In French, was very very chauvinistic, and in Vienna, it wasn't. And uh, okay, never mind. I just continue. One must have practical experience of such a milieu so as to be able to picture the state of affairs that arises from these mutual rec recriminations when the father physically assaults the mother and maltreats her in a fit of drunken rage. At the age of six, the child can no longer ignore those sordid details, which even an adult would find revolting. Infected, infected with moral poison, bodily undernourished, and a poor little head filled with vermin, the young citizen goes to the primary school. With difficulty, he barely learns to re read and write. There is no possibility of learning any lessons at home. Quite the contrary, the father and mother themselves talk before the children in the most disparaging way about the teacher and the school, and they are much more inclined to insult the teachers than to put their offspring across the knee and knock sound reason into him. What, what the little fellow hears at home does not tend to increase respect for his human surroundings. Here nothing good is said of human nature as a whole and every institution. From the school to the government is reviled. Whether religion and morals are concerned or the state and the social order, it is all the same. They are all scoffed at. When the young lad when a young lad leaves school at the age of 14, it would be difficult to say what are the most striking features of his character. Incredible ignorance in so far as real knowledge is concerned, is concerned or, cynical, or cynical impudence combined with an attitude towards morality, which is really startling at so young an age. Oh, it just seems to be... See, seem to be talking about himself, yeah, the violence he suffered uh, due to his father. What station in life can such a person fail, to whom nothing is sacred, who has never experienced anything noble, but on the contrary has been intimately acquainted with the lowest kind of human existence? This child of three has got into the habit of reviling all authority by the time he's 15. He has been acquainted only with moral filth and vileness, everything being excluded that might stimulate his thought towards higher things. And now this young specimen of humanity enters the school of life. He leads the same kind of life which was exemplified for him by his father during his childhood. He loiters about and comes home at all hours. He now even blackguards that broken-hearted being who gave, who gave him birth. He curses God and even the world and the world and finally ends up in a house of correction for young people. There he gets the final polish. And his bourgeois contemporaries are astonished at the lack of patriotic enthusiasm which this young citizen manifests. Day after day, the bourgeois world are witnesses to the phenomenon of spreading poison among the people through the instrumentality of the theatre and the cinema, gutter journalism and obscene books. And yet, they are astonished at the deplorable moral standards and national indifference of the masses, as if the cinema bilge and the gutter press and such like could inculcate knowledge of the greatness of one's country, apart entirely from the earlier education of the individual. I then came to understand quickly and thoroughly what I had never been aware of before. It was the following. The question of nationalizing a people is first and foremost one of 
establishing healthy social conditions, which will furnish the grounds that are necessary for the education of the individual. For only when family upbringing and school education have inculcated in the individual a knowledge of the cultural and economic and above all the political greatness of his own country. Then, and then only, will it be possible for him to feel proud of being a citizen of such a country. I can fight only for something I, that I love. I can, only, I can love only what I respect. And in order to respect a thing, I must at least have some knowledge of it. As soon as my interest in social questions was once aw- awakened, I began to study them in a fundamental way. A new and he that, a new and he that to unknown world was thus revealed to me, in the years nineteen, nineteen o nine to nineteen ten. I had so far improved my position that I no longer had to earn my daily bread as a manual laborer. I was now working independently as draughtsman and painter in watercolors. This mat here. Was a poor one indeed, as far as earnings were concerned, for the for these were only sufficient to meet the bare exigencies of life. Yet it had an interest for me in view of the profession to which I aspired. Moreover, when I came home in the evenings, I was now no. I was now no longer that tired as formerly. When I used to be unable to look into a book without falling asleep almost immediately, my present occupation therefore was in line with the profession I aimed at for the future. Moreover, I was master of my own time and could distribute my working hours now better than formerly. I painted in order to earn my bread, and I studied because I liked it. Thus, I was able to acquire that theoretical knowledge of the social problem, which was a necessary complement to what I was learning through actual experience. I studied all the books which I could find that dealt dealt with this question, and I thought. Deeply on what I read, I think that the milieu in milieu in which I then lived considered me an eccentric person. Besides, my interest in the social question, I naturally devoted myself with enthusiasm to the study of architecture. Side by side with music, I considered it queen of the arts. To study it was for me not work but pleasure. I could read or draw until the small hours of the morning, without ever getting tired. And I became more and more confident that my dream of a brilliant future would become true, even though I should have to wait long years for its fulfillment. I was firmly convinced that one day I should make a name for myself as an architect. The fact that side by side with my professional studies, I took the greatest interest in everything that had to do with politics did not seem to me to signify anything of great importance. On the contrary, I looked upon this practical interest in politics merely as part of an elementary obligation that devolves. On every thinking man, those who have no understanding of the political world around them have no right to criticize or complain on political questions. Therefore, I still continue to read and study a great deal. But reading had probably a different significance for me from that which it has for the average run of our so-called intellectuals. I know people who read. Interminably, book after book, from page to page, and yet I should not call them well-read people. Of course, they know an immense amount, but their brain seems incapable of assorting and classifying the material which they have gathered from books. They have not the faculty of distinguishing between what is useful and useless in a book, so that they may retain the former in their minds and, if possible, skip over the latter while reading it. If that be not possible, then, when once read, throw it overboard as useless ballast. Reading is not an end in itself, but a means to an end. Its chief purpose is to help towards 
filling in the framework which is made up of the talents and capabilities that each individual possesses. Thus, each one procures for himself the implements and materials necessary for the fulfillment of his calling in life. No matter whether this be the elementary task of earning one's daily bread or a calling that responds to a higher human aspirations, such is the first purpose of reading, and the second purpose is to give a general knowledge of the world in which we lived. In both cases, however, the material which one has acquired through reading must not be stored up in the memory on a plan that corresponds to the successive chapters of the book. But each little piece of knowledge thus gained must be treated as if it were a little stone to be inserted into a mosaic, so that it finds its proper place among all the other pieces and particles that help to form a general world picture in the brain of the reader. Otherwise, only a confused jumble of chaotic notions will result from all this reading. That jumble is not merely useless, but it also tends to make the unfortunate possessor of it conceited. For he seriously considers himself a well-educated person and thinks that he understands something of life. He believes that he has acquired knowledge. So that he finds it proper place among all the other pi- other pieces. For he seriously considers himself a well-educated person and thinks that he understands something of life. He believes that he has acquired knowledge, whereas the truth is that every increase in such knowledge, open and close inverted comma knowledge, draws him more and more away from real life until he finally ends up in some sanatorium or takes to politics and becomes a parliamentary deputy. Such a person never succeeds in turning his knowledge to practical account when the opportune moment arrives, for his mental equipment is not ordered with a view to meeting the demands of everyday life. His knowledge is taught in his brain as a literal transcript of the books he has read and the order of succession in which he has read them, and if fate should one day call upon him to use some of his book knowledge for certain practical ends in life, that very call would have to name the book and give the number of the page, for the poor noodle himself would never be able to find a spot where he gathered the information now called for. But if the page is not mentioned at a critical moment, the widely read intellectual will find himself in a state of hopeless embarrassment. In a high state of agitation, he searches for analogous cases, and it is almost a dead certainty that he will finally deliver the wrong prescription. If that is not a correct description, then how can we explain the political achievements of our parliamentary heroes who hold the highest positions in the government of the country. Otherwise, we should have to attribute the doings of such political leaders not to pathological conditions, but simply to malice and chicanery. chicanery. On the other hand, one who has cultivated the art of reading will instantly will instantly discern in a book or journal or pamphlet what ought to be remembered because it meets one's personal needs or is of value as general knowledge. What he thus learns is incorporated in his mental analogue of this or that problem or thing, further further correcting the mental picture or enlarging it so that it becomes more exact and precise. Should some practical problem suddenly demand examination or solution, memory will immediately select the opportune information from the mass that has been acquired through years of reading, and will place this information at the service of one's powers of judgment, so as to get a new and clearer view of the problem in question or produce a definitive solution. I'll stop here and...
perhaps we'll continue another read some days in the future. See you. Goodbye.